I'm honored to be here. I appreciate the invitation and kudos to Bloomberg for doing this, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is the first, and I, I suspect won't be the last time that a conference focused on diversity uh, will be held. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Annette, who's worked very hard. Where's Annette? Wave your hand back there to put together an extraordinary list of speakers, and my friend Sona Pacioli, who three weeks on the job, Bloomberg, listen, you're lucky to have her. I don't know if you know that or not, but trust me, take it from me. <clears throat> this is really a singular honor for me because in addition to what's already in the program about Mary and her bio, um, I should tell you that um, when the Minority Corporate Council Association uh, had my predecessor announce that she was leaving after 10 years on the job, uh, the task of finding a replacement fell to the person who was then the newly minted chairperson of the board of MCCA, one Mary Snap. <laughs> Welcome to the board. <laughs> We've known each other a little while. We have known each other a while. I had the privilege of serving uh, under Mary in the two years that she was chairperson of the board of MCCA. Uh, and so I'm really honored to have this opportunity to talk with her. Um, Microsoft, I think there are a number of companies who have established themselves as sort of gold standard companies in the diversity and inclusion space. Microsoft is one of them. Uh, thanks in no small part to some of the work you've done, to Brad and That's his leadership. So yeah. um, talk a little bit about generally diversity and inclusion at Microsoft, why it's important to a company like Microsoft. Yeah. No, it's a, um, I love to talk about this. Um, I, Microsoft, as with a, a new CEO, kind of new, been about a year or so with Satya Nadella, we did a lot of work on thinking about what the, what the purpose and the mission of the company was. And I think that the mission that we have now really speaks to diversity and inclusion. The mission for the company overall is that we want to empower every person on the planet to achieve more. And if you think about that broad mission, you can talk about it, yes, achieving more, because we're going to build another version of Windows. But what we really mean is that we want every person on the planet to achieve more. So when you start with a big corporate mission like that, it really helps you get a good setup for work that we've already been doing and actually want to continue to keep doing. Um, we have really been focused on issues of ethnicity and gender for a long time at Microsoft. I think if you look just recently at some of the recent announcements, we've added um, uh, two women to our board at our last quarterly meeting. So we now have three women of 11 on the, on the board of directors. Our uh, chairman of the board is John Thompson, who African-American, who is just great. I mean, he's, he, John Thompson and I actually, seven or eight or 10, I don't even know how many years ago, um, I provided some legal work on the other side of a deal with John Thompson. And I know what a great guy he is and yeah. what a fabulous leader he is to have on our board. In terms of the department itself, the legal department itself, we have been on a journey with diversity and inclusion for, in a very um, focused way for 12 or 13 years or so. And I think it's important to actually say that you're on a journey and you're starting. And it has to be Why something that's Why do you make that distinction, focused. Mary? You've said that before, and I like the way that you put that. Why do you think that's important? Because I think it's important to set goals and to work towards them. Because it's great if people feel really good about something, and it's great if we have a thousand points of light, yeah. but you have to set goals. I think you have to get focused and you have to strive. Isn't that also a recognition of the fact that we all find ourselves at different places in this journey? Yeah. Um, a company that I used to work for that I won't name, but it rhymes with Walmart, um, <laughs> you, you, you prided itself on a decidedly more stick approach right. to diversity and inclusion with its outside law firms on the carrot stick spectrum. Yeah. I mean, it, it would literally brag about, you know, firing firms that didn't measure up. Yeah. I think a lot of the both inward facing and outward facing programs that Walmart, I mean, that Microsoft's department has yeah. done, particularly the bonuses and that sort of stuff, yeah. which I'll ask you to talk about, falls closer on the carrot, the incentive side of things. Tell me about those, first of all, yeah. and explain why you think that's a better approach. Well, you know, we, um, we were, obviously, we were well aware of the approach of, of a number of, of departments. And I guess we thought a couple of things. We thought, 
it does not make sense for law firms to just pound, or sorry, for law departments to pound on law firms. Right. In large part because, you know, not that many law departments were that transparent themselves right. about the same things that they were asking the law firms to do. Do what I say, not as I do, basically. So we wanted to be real transparent about what our own numbers were. Right. And then we wanted to start to talk to law firms about how we could work together. Um, we thought it was important that we're actually, the thing is, this is an ecosystem, you know, and, and you, can't just, you can't just have one part of it yeah. working. Everybody has to work together to right. make a difference. And we thought we would do a lot better if we had a partnership yeah. than if we didn't. And so we developed a program, it's about seven years or so now, we developed a program where um, we decided that we would offer, voluntary, but we would offer our largest law firms a 2% bonus at the end of the year, cash bonus, if they either improved the demographics of the lawyers who worked on Microsoft Matters or they improved the demographics of the firm as a whole. And we went to our law firms and we asked them what they thought about it and they were skeptical. I mean, they were like, what? Did they not think you were serious or did they not think, I mean, they, they, they didn't want the extra money? I mean, what, what am I missing here? They were what is like, wrong with these firm people? <laughs> They, Walmart fires you, that's okay. Microsoft offers you money? No, I know, but they, they, you know, they wanted to know exactly how it was going to be scheduled and exactly what sort of impact we were going to have in terms of inviting lawyers to work on their matters. And right. you know, we actually had some pretty tense. We had some, t at first, we could tell it was awkward. And then we realized that what, what we really needed to do, we sent out an anonymous survey about the program so people could really tell us what they thought, because these were our, the firms that we partnered with. And what they came back with it was, they said, hey, you know, we really want you to have some skin in the game. This is really a partnership. Mm. It's fine you know, with the money, but we want you to help us achieve the goal. So we want you to have mentoring programs, and we want you to have your tone at the top. And we looked at that, and we said, Okay, let's take it a step further. This is the part I love. <laughs> let's take it a step further. If we don't, if, the, if, if most of the firms do not achieve that goal, we set like 80% or something. If they didn't achieve that goal, we were going to dock the personal bonuses of the leaders in the legal department. Would you say that again, please? <laughs> are, are you guys getting this? So we thought, you know, it's, you, you know, you have to be in it together. That's you, right. You just have to be in it together. And, and you know, we sort of tell the story that the very first year, the firms actually did not achieve the goal. Well, not only that, I, I remember having a conversation a few years ago with Brad Smith, yeah. the general counsel, yeah. about that program where his direct reports had to meet certain metrics right. in order to meet sort of their own bonuses. And I asked Brad, I said, you know, how many years did people not meet their goals? And he said, just the first year. Yeah, just the first year. <laughs> it's then, amazing then it, how that gets people's attention. Yeah, it made yeah. it absolutely made a difference, and to you know make it real. So I think that's another measure. You you have to be sure that you actually are accountable for for the work that you do. You yeah, have to be accountable. I do want to go back before we go on to talk a little bit more about why diversity right. is important because I know we all say it and we we know it, right. but I do think that. We are a better legal department as a result of focusing on this work. Why, Mary? Why is that the case? I think, I mean, if you really look at a partnership that we've had with our law firms, if we just look at the data, right. I mean, we look at our litigation record. Our litigation record in terms of win losses over the last three years, 89 wins, six losses with our partners in our diversity work. Our patent licensing program, we signed 64 deals last year. We use a, a Wimby firm to do a lot of that outside yeah. licensing work. We launched Windows 10 around the world. You cannot launch a product around the world and ensure that you're going to meet the requirements all over the world unless you have people who understand laws around the world and meet diverse kinds of goals. So yeah. I think objectively we are a better legal department because we've focused on diversity. And I'm going to say one other thing here because I just think it's so um, important. We, we try to recognize things that we do and goals with quarterly meetings and whatnot of the legal department. And we recognize, you know, accomplishments and, and, and deals. 
At our very last meeting, I was sitting you know, in the front row as we were giving an award for a group of lawyers who came together to do a, um, a really, really complicated deal with a really cantankerous partner that cut across various segments. And we put the uh, photos of the lawyers who, had, who did that deal, and it was Sonia Johnston, who is in the room. Sonia, raise your hand, Sonia. And uh, two other African-American women lawyers. And it was great to see uh, these three women of color lawyers recognized for, huh, I think that deal, you know, it, you, yeah, it was, and, and so I, it's important to recognize success, and it's important to know that, you know, yes. these lawyers brought this deal home. Yeah. It was great. Kudos. Yay. Congratulations. <clears throat> well, I, I mean, just even prior to MCCA, um, through my involvement with MCCA, with the National Bar Association, I've gotten to know a lot of the extraordinary diverse talent that you guys have at Microsoft, people like Sonia, like Bruce Jackson mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, Elka Suber, others, you know. All and, who are leaders and, in their and, own right. Exactly. They're not only extraordinarily talented lawyers, but you guys are also sort of evangelize, which is a, a yeah. title that's important at Microsoft, Yes. and send the message out about what's important to you through work with various bar associations yeah. as well. Yeah, I think it's really important um, to know that you do good work and that you also need to advocate for yeah. the cause. You absolutely need to do that. So in terms of the kinds of thing we've, we've done is we've looked at what, what seem to be like intractable issues. Pipeline, for example, is an right. intractable issue. Um, three or four years ago, we uh, hired a Harvard Law professor and then we hired a consulting group to do a study to try to understand what the pipeline issues were. Right. And as a result of that, we learned that there was a sharp drop off between college and law school in terms of African American and Latino students. That if we could only convert, if we could only convert these really strong college graduates to come to law school instead of places that uh, these, these people were going, which was honestly more to engineering and medical school than they were going to law school, we could actually really, really increase the pipeline. What were the reasons? Did they, were they not aware of the law as an option, not interested, not prepared to exercise that option? Or was it a combination of factors? The thing is, I don't think we really know. We, we, we then you know, engaged in a second study to try to benchmark across these other professions, professions that, where you had to have essentially a license to mm -hmm. perform your profession, so medical and uh, accounting. And we learned that there were some things that felt like really different processes. So if you think about medical school, well, think about law school. You come in, you take these tests, nothing really matters till you graduate, and then it doesn't matter again till you pass the bar. Right. And a lot of times it costs you another three or four thousand dollars to figure out how to pass the bar. You know, you're already in debt. Um, you, you know, you need to, you're, you're struggling, and sometimes the bar exam itself is two or three thousand dollars. That's right. That is not the case in either the accounting profession or the medical profession. You take these tests along the way, and yeah. in terms of medical school, you finish a program, you take a test, you get, you know, that part is done. Mm -hmm. You have internships along the way. I mean, but it it's seems like the solutions that you're getting at are fundamental changes in how well, the whole legal system is set up. I mean, what do you do? What programs did you guys put in place after you learned what you learned? If any? Well, it's, it's really interesting. So we, we spent some time talking to um, deans of law schools. And uh, I hate to say it, but deans of law schools are really focused on ensuring that the law school is number one. Right. And they care that their students get jobs because it accrues back to their, their law school is number one. But they don't necessarily care about you know, the, the, what they would view as the trade mm. of, being, uh, of being a lawyer. That's probably not a surprise to most and people And so in this room. what we thought was really important is that we think about a way to help, again, bridge that gap. One, I just think it's great that law schools are doing a lot more clinical programs. Right. That actually helps a lot. But we uh, started a program. We, we said, okay, we'll focus on one law school. And we went to the University of Washington. Dean Kelly Testy there is, is, is really amazing. We did a partnership 
with the dean, with, the, um, with law firms, about 10 law firms in the area and about 10 law departments in the area. We collaborated with the dean. We put together a program, we just launched it this year, where uh, the 10 firms and departments agreed that we would provide a 1L 10-year paid fellowship to students that the dean would identify and recruit with this fellowship, this partnership, yeah. to come to UW. And she would be able to recruit saying that if you come here, these firms and these departments will offer you and pay you for a summer. You just need to come back for a second year. Yeah. And oh, by the way, if you come back um, for a third year at the end, the firms will, and the departments together, will provide $5,000 stipend so that you can take the time that you need to study for the bar. Also along the way, we're doing some mentoring programs. We've got the former governor of the state of Washington, Chris Gregoire, is going to come in and do some mentoring along the way. So we've put together a program that is a, an attractor of students to this good law school getting better. Right. We hope it will be an attractor for those students then to stay in the Seattle area to practice law. And we've put together what we hope will be kind of a holistic framework of inclusion, mm -hmm. really, so that they feel like they are mentored along the way, that they have friends in the community. And by the way, the law firms are already wanting to know who their 1L is That's going fantastic. to be. We just introduced the students last week. And that shows that these ideas are sort of having the effect of pollinating throughout your, yeah. your network. Yeah. All right, so let me, let's change gears for a second and let me ask you this question. Um, show of hands, how many law firm representatives are in the room? And how many corporate folks? Now, Mary, what I learned working at Walmart, you're at Microsoft, not everybody has the bandwidth yeah. of a Microsoft, of a Walmart. Yeah. Um, you know, we basically have to meet entities where they are in this journey, but also right. in their ability to effectuate programs and to do things. Yeah. What do you say to companies or to law firms that you know, are still at nascent stages in the journey, yeah. diversity and inclusion, and that may not have necessarily the bandwidth to do something on a broader scale? Not everybody can get the former governor to come and be a part of your mentoring program. Yeah, no, I, what I say honestly, I mean, I know I'm, I, today you're looking at me and you think I miss Microsoft, but I grew up in Newton, Kansas. It was like 12,000 people, you know? And there were law firms in Newton, Kansas. Not very many of them had women. Yeah. Actually, there was one woman lawyer in the entire county as I was growing up there. Wow. <laughs> what so, are the numbers now? Well, I don't <laughs> <laughs> She's still there. <laughs> <laughs> and if you get stopped, call her. <laughs> uh, I guess what I would say is you have to start. I mean, you, and you have to experiment. I went back actually a couple of years ago and, um, the, and I, the first year in law school I went back to, to, that, to Wichita and I went to a law firm for the summer and I listened to two partners, you know, one who was more evolved than the other, you know. And this one partner was laughing and he said, you know, Joe, he's this tough guy and he wants to settle a case from the guy across with the firm across town and he was complaining, he said, I want to settle the case, and he puts a lawyer named Robin on the case. Mm. And Robin happened to be male, okay, so it would, it's like the guy ended up fine. That was 40 years ago. I went five years ago and I spoke to the county bar there. You sense resistance, you don't, you know, it, so I guess what I would say is you have to somehow start to change a culture. And you have to begin, as you say, where you are. Right. And, you know, it could be finding, you know, the first lawyer who is there and who's willing to, like, persevere and honestly be lonely for a while. Because a lot of my career, I was lonely, you sure. know. And, um, but, you, but you have to find a way to support. I mean, one of the things that I always, a story I always think back on, was a, this was a really big Philadelphia law firm. I gave a speech on diversity um, at the, it's ABA Women Profession, um, and I gave, actually, it was, people gave me a standing ovation. It was, I thought it was a great speech. And afterwards, you know, there are always a number of people who want to come talk to you. This young African-American American woman came up to me, and she looked like she was going to cry. 
And, you know, she shook my hand and um, she said, I am the only African American and the only woman in this law firm. And they put me in charge of the diversity committee. They put me on the diversity committee. And she said, so far, I think I'm the only person on it. She is the committee. I, and, and what, and, you know, what do I do? And I thought, you know, she's going to leave, yeah. right? She's, she's just, really, and I thought about all the years I was lonely, and I don't know why I didn't leave, but she's going to leave. So what I would say is with law firms and law departments, you don't have to start like Microsoft. You just have to start with this culture of change. Right. You have to figure out what the tone will be from the top. You know, you can't be that lawyer who's upset because Robin is on the other side of the case. Right. You have to start at the top and you just have to start. And you have to experiment and you have to be a little bit bold and you have to get out of your comfort zone. Yes. One of the things that you guys are doing with NCCA that I think is just great is the unconscious bias work. Yeah. And, and if a firm can't really get there in terms of like really getting going with you know, a big diversity effort and setting goals, they can get going with inclusion work. I think it's really important. I mean, you might want to talk a minute about that because I think it's yeah, great. So it, that's, the, the genesis of that was our discovery through the research we had done as well as other entities of the fact that the biggest problem in terms of diversity and inclusion for most entities isn't that they weren't recruiting diverse slates of candidates. It's that they weren't retaining them and more importantly, right. weren't advancing them to leadership roles. And the reason is because, a number of reasons, but the most important reason, the most systemic reason was bias. You know, this unconscious bias that affected every part of the career trajectory, whether it's recruiting issues, yeah. conversations around compensation, evaluation, even the assignment of work, and each of those is critical. Uh, and so we created a program focused on uh, implicit bias training that we rolled out to our law firms and corporate members that's been very helpful in helping them identify barriers to inclusion and eradicating them and perhaps making it better opportunities for people to advance through the ranks. Yeah, and, and, and I would say at, at Microsoft, we have done um, uh, unconscious bias training now one -on, in one-on-one -on -one meetings with senior executives, one to say 20 people in a room, two to three hour, for uh, the most senior and the direct reports to the most senior people. We have now done a, a one hour video program that is uh, mandatory for every employee yeah. uh, to spend time and to go through that program. It's, it's so interesting, you, you, this is, you know, the people in this room care a lot about this work. Yes. But I will say it is a process of learning all along the way. And I have spent, a lot of time thinking about the implicit bias stuff. I took the implicit bias training, uh, the online, you know, yeah, every, yeah. if you haven't done that, you should really do that. You guys I, familiar with that? The it, Harvard implicit bias? Yeah. yeah. You should do it if you haven't it's, done it. Uh, it's it, eye-opening. It's eye-opening. No, it's <laughs> truly, I, and so I was going to be taking the two-hour implicit bias training course. I'm like, okay, you know, I got this. I've been doing this. I like, you know, get it. You know, I'm going to be, having just hold myself back from taking over the room and all <laughs> So I, so but, but of course I do it at, in the morning, like it's five in the morning, yeah. uh, and I'm at my computer, and I've got the cup of coffee, I'm wearing what you wear at five in the morning, you know, I've got at least one cat in my lap, you know, and I'm like doing it, <laughs> and I take, and I get the results back, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, the cat runs away, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I, the cat is gone, the, the coffee is still, <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm like, you know, you can always learn and get better in this work. And that's what I would say, whether you're a Microsoft or whether you're you know, a five-person shop, you can find a way to learn and you can always get better in this work. It, it's persistence. I mean, we, it's persistence. Do we have time for a question or two from the audience? I want to give that opportunity if it's okay. How are we on time? Oh, 945, okay, We have like perfect. 10 minutes or something like Good. that? Good are there question. thoughts with people in the room? This is a perfect opportunity. We didn't actually tell you ahead of time, so I know people maybe have needed to You didn't see it in it. the program. Um, Mary was the first female lawyer hired at Microsoft. I, I can only imagine what an extraordinary experience that's been. And before Deputy General Counsel, she also had the Products and Services Group. Yeah. The, which yeah, I would say that is, you know, I, 
I, I was, I think, lawyer number four or five, you know. Overall? However, yeah. First female, but number four or five four overall. Four or five, and we're at now about 450 lawyers in 55 countries. So, oh. you know, we've really grown. And I will say, if you think about experiences, um, you know, I benefited from being uh, a woman because we had a general counsel who looked around and saw, you know, he it's a guy named Bill Newcomb who has been very much a proponent of civil rights from you know his beginning days as a sure. young lawyer and i think he was he was quite interested in wanting to you know in his mind begin diversity and so i actually benefited from that yes. i got there and it was you know a whirlwind of experience and i am not kidding when i say it was lonely um i um I can't tell you how many meetings I would walk into where there would be 10 men and me. Uh, some of them I was the only one wearing shoes for some period of time. Um, <laughs> Just because it was a culture that was... Well, I was going to say, were you back in Kansas? No, then, or? we just, you know, there were years well, all there. All due respect to Kansas. There were years there where, I mean, you know, most people, you had to wear a shirt, but, you know, people wore <laughs> shorts. God for that. People, I mean, there were people who wore capes. There were, I mean, we had pets in the office and those. It was, you know, a kind yeah. of a different place to work. Sure. Um, one of the things I love about it, though, today is... You know, you can go in a building at Microsoft and, you know, on your way up to the 10th floor or something like that. In addition to English, you will hear often at least two other languages. Yeah. And that is one of the things that really, that really keeps me interested is that, you know, the diversity of the people there is really, really wonderful. So we do have a question, yes. I feel like I should ask about shoes and capes now, but I'm not. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to hold on to that, that, maybe for drinks later. <laughs> so I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when you all were sitting down and thinking about what was the right way to set the metrics for the bonus. Yeah. Because I imagine you were thinking we could set it so high it would be unachievable. Yeah. We could set it somewhere in the middle, but some people would achieve that, some wouldn't. How would they strive for it? So walk me through what went into that process yeah. and how you ultimately- Ended up ultimately... at 2%, right? Yeah. No, I the... think I'm gonna, it's not, the 2% was the dollars, but I okay. think what you're asking about is how we set the metrics for them to achieve it. Precisely. Uh, yeah. I see. So it's a great question. Um, we, we, we looked at what the profession had been achieving, of course, and that the numbers are not going up. And so, we, we, and we looked at what we thought we personally could achieve, honestly. And so we set the metrics at, uh, in our department, we have tried to increase by one half one of 1% 1 the number of um, ethnically diverse people. And we've tried to improve each year over year, and we've tried to improve by a full point the number of female attorneys. Um, year over year, and we have been able to do that. And so we set similar metrics with the law firms. We said they could either do it because they improved their own demographics of people working on our matters or uh, on, of the firm. We were both excited and somewhat disappointed that the firms, by and large, achieved it by increasing the demographics of the lawyers who worked on our matters. So we went over seven years from um, 33% of the lawyers working on, on our matters being diverse to 47 or 48% of the lawyers on our matters being diverse. And then now this, this is includes gender, ethnicity, LGBT, veterans. And so we kind of got to the point where we looked at it, but the leadership, of course, of the firms, as we all know, has not become more diverse, and the broad demographics of the firms have not become more diverse. So this year, we actually changed the program. And we are now awarding the bonus based on leadership changes. Mm. So for the years going forward, we'll be looking at representation on the management committee, the lawyer who is the partner on our account, the lead lawyers doing our deals, for example. And, and we're in the first year of that. We haven't gotten results back. The law firms have actually welcomed that. They actually got to the point where they said, geez, you know, we, we also know that at 47, 48% working on your stuff, you know, we actually want to do something more broad. So we have the same number of firms, again, voluntary signing on. And this year, as, just as a result of looking at seven years of data, both within this program and in the industry, the legal profession, we decided to change the metrics. 
So Mary, that, that, there's, there is one thing we did when I was at Walmart that I think speaks very much to that, and that was we diversified the ranks of the company's uh, relationship partners who were doing yeah. work with them, made them a lot more diverse, both racially and gender-wise. And an interesting thing happened, the quality of the work improved yeah. considerably. Yeah. And I, I think anecdotally, just talking, because at the time I was in charge of the outside council management group, what I learned is that a lot of those minority relationship partners, when they got the opportunity to be the point person for a client like that, they killed it yeah. because they knew that this was their opportunity right. to shine. They didn't have other competing large institutional clients competing for their attention. And generally, diverse lawyers know <laughs> You get the quick hook if something goes south. So you're a lot more engaged, you're not more responsive, and that level of responsiveness is something that really is hard to come by a lot yeah, of times. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I think it's important actually for departments to give feedback to firms. And I think we probably don't do it enough when lawyers do a good job. Well, and also the reverse is true. I noticed the first thing you mentioned when you were trying to roll out the program initially is that the firm said, yeah, we but we want pregnant. you to do something. So right. there were a lot of firm hands that went up. So speak briefly about sort of managing back up and whether or not firms can and should do the same thing to their clients. In terms of giving feedback. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's, it's really important that we do that. Which that means, you know, you have to have a trusted relationship, of course. That's right. You know, for a while we, with this program, we, we brought all the firms together a couple of times a year. I think Walmart, did, or you did something like yeah, that too. that's right. It actually didn't go that well. No, really, it, why? It really, um, I think people were somewhat uncomfortable. It, it, I think it was, a, it, it works a lot better when you, have that one-on-one -on -one relationship and yeah. you know you can call and say hey what's going on here this is not really looking that good this quarter mm -hmm. i mean one of the things we learned the first year that the program you know did not meet its its goals is that we didn't really focus on the numbers to the last 60 days of the year and that was that was just sort of a mistake you needed to be looking at it real time through the course of the year, yeah. all the time. You needed to be looking at least on a quarterly basis. And yes. you, you, know, you, you have to stay engaged. You just have to stay engaged. You're so extraordinarily bad as lawyers at feedback, giving yeah. and receiving it. So that's, that's very important. Uh, one other question, I believe. Uh, it's more of a statement. So I'm with Autism Speaks. And I actually just wanted to evangelize Microsoft for the announcement earlier this year where there's a program, a pilot program, where you are taking on 10 adults with autism and placing them and matching up their skills and placing them with jobs. Thank and so as we speak about diversity and inclusion, I just thought that that was just something uh, that you should be commended for. Thank and you. that should also just be noted. Thank you. Let That's me, if fantastic. I could just, um, if I could just comment on that though, um, you know, we have to talk about diversity and inclusion across the board. There is no question about that. And uh, as a company, we actually have a pilot program going where we are bringing in uh, people with disabilities, um, uh, largely on the autism spectrum, working in various places at Microsoft, um, and we have a recruiting program underway. I will say, you know, if you talk about personal experiences, that really a, a turning point in my work in diversity came just about two years ago when uh, actually I came to Los Angeles to receive an award that Microsoft's legal department was given from the ABA and the People with Disabilities. And I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I, I got to the event, I was there to deliver a short keynote, and then, you know, I had like all the other things that you do during the course uh, of, of a day. And I got there on time, early, and the entire conference was two hours late. The entire conference. Because the leadership of the program, all of whom had various physical disabilities, <clears throat> needed a, a special bus to pick them up, the bus got lost oh, wow. and broke down. And so everything was just two hours late. And at first I was like, oh, I just cannot believe this. You know, yeah. it's like, ah. And, and then I went and tried to get online. I couldn't get online. And so, and I was just so frustrated. And then I thought, what am I doing? Yeah. I should just go out and meet some people. And I spent two hours really talking to all of the participants in that forum. And honestly, it was life changing to sort of, to see what these lawyers overcame. And I don't mean to say it's courageous or anything like right, that. Right. I mean to say, these were like fabulous lawyers who are working in an 
in, in the law, and we are largely overlooking this population, too. And we need to have inclusion at all levels. Um, I, I, rode back to the, I rode back to the airport with um, a, a lawyer who, um, who was on crutches. He was, um, had had cancer, and so had, his leg was amputated. He showed me the engagement ring that he was going to present to his fiance that weekend. You know, and he was just full of joy and life, you know, um, and, and the full life that he led. Yeah. And it's just, it is so important for us to think about people with disabilities as part of this discussion as well. So thank you for raising that. Thank you so much. I was involved in a conversation recently, and the client noted that going beyond or just looking at representation is no longer sufficient, is no longer acceptable. Yeah. So what conversations are you having with law firms? How are you holding them accountable in regards to going beyond counting people to yeah. really making people count? No, you are, that's, that is, you are exactly right. Representation is not enough. And right. I think we, we, we all recognize that. And the, the change to our law firm diversity program that I've spoken about goes exactly to that. So we're no longer just focusing on the numbers of lawyers working on our matters. We are focusing on, is there a diverse person leading the matter? Is there a diverse person who is our relationship partner? And I could not agree with you more on the question of, of going beyond representation. One of the things that we did, again, when I was at Walmart, was we got involved in asking the firms to certify that the relationship partners we selected were receiving origination credit. Now that was controversial because firms were saying, well, now you're dipping too far. Your nose is too far under the tent. You're getting in your own business. That's the push. But the nexus of growth and development and retention is who's got the relationship with the client. And of course, in firms, the currency that everybody understands is who benefits financially from that relationship and how you grow and develop. My question for you is how much should corporate entities sort of insert themselves into the business of the law firm yeah. for purposes of advancing diversity? Uh, and I guess the answer to that is a broad one. Um, I, don't, I, I think, I'll just say, corporate law departments should not ask law firms to do anything that they're not willing to do themselves. So I think if, you know, if a law department wants to be out there and is going to do that, I think it can ask its law firms. But yeah. I don't think it, ha it cannot be an imbalanced situation. It has to be a partnership. We're all in it together. That's an excellent response. So our time is almost up. If we do have one more question, if not, I'm going to ask one last question for you, Mary. And this is on a personal note. I mean, you've had an extraordinary career. Uh, Microsoft obviously has been very fortunate to have you uh, from, you know, the you have a degree in journalism, an MBA, your law degree. You started your career in General Motors in public relations, if I'm did. not mistaken. Talk if that about doesn't a compare you, <laughs> place. <laughs> I'm sure you've got plenty of stories there. Uh, first female lawyer at Microsoft, fourth or fifth lawyer overall. You've been involved in just about every major transaction in the growth and development of the company since then. What would you like your legacy to be? Oh my goodness! At some point. If you didn't tell me. You did not tell me you were going to ask this question. Know me by now. Yeah, I did not tell me. You know, I don't even think that far ahead to think that I, ha you know, should actually be at a place where I have a legacy. I will just say that I'm not done yet, and uh, I have another couple of turns actually at Microsoft. And um, what I would love is to and on see, MCCA's board too, right? Yes. All right, thanks. And I, what I would love to see is, you know, to look around. When I first came to Microsoft, I looked in a room and there was nobody who looked like me. I hope that I have a legacy of having made a difference that when I look in a room at Microsoft, lots of people look like all different colors and, and, and genders. And that, I hope, will, I, ha I, hope will, uh, I will have made a little difference. Perfect note to end on. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Mary. You.